Hello everyone and welcome to another Kirby Allison live stream. Uh, today is a very special day. Uh, we've got some great guests with us and I couldn't be more thankful for everyone taking a little bit of time out of their day to join us on one of these live streams. A nice little uh, retreat, if you will, uh, from the realities of everyone being locked up at home. Uh, uh, if you're joining us from, uh, if you're joining us right now, please do let us know where you're joining from. Uh, and if you're, uh, if you're in good enough fortune to be enjoying a libation and maybe even a cigar, please do let us know in the comments section uh, kind of your beverage and cigar of choice. Uh, just a few announcements before we get started. Uh, today, of course, is the last of another weekly series. This is our third week of daily live streams. Uh, we'll have another Shoeshine Sunday live stream uh, this Sunday at 1 p.m. Central Time, same time as today. Uh, and the next week, we've got an exciting schedule of additional guests that we're lining up and confirming uh, right now. So make sure you follow me on Instagram, at Kirby Allison, so that you can uh, learn of that full schedule whenever we release it. Uh, we, of course, here at The Hangar Project are still in business, um, so anything you can do uh, to pass the time that we can help you with, uh, we're shipping orders very quickly. HangarProject.com, your largest collection of luxury garment care, shoe care, and other luxury clothing accessories in, uh, in the world. Uh, today, I'm wearing a, a beautiful tie. This is uh, probably one of my favorite ties. If we had a Kirby Allison Club tie, this would be it. Uh, it's our sovereign grade basket weave tie. Uh, and I'm wearing my stroller today uh, because uh, today we're going to London. And uh, this stroller is oftentimes what I wear whenever I'm in the city. Uh, and this tie is one uh, that I, again, often wear uh, whenever I'm wearing my stroller. Uh, two other quick announcements. We got a huge shipment of uh, sovereign grade or Wellington shoelaces in recently. Uh, so we're fully stocked there. Uh, finest laces, these are sourced from Northampton and um, of our, are of the Edward Green, uh, Gatsion and Gerling, or John Lobb quality uh, that anyone would come to expect. So a great way to uh, really uh, increase uh, the finish of a pair of shoes. And then finally, we're running a promotion uh, on our shoe restoration service. Uh, for the month of April, uh, we're offering a free upgrade uh, with uh, toe plates. So any full restoration job will receive a pair of toe plates for free. That's a $65 value. Uh, our uh, resident cobbler, Jim, is locked at home also. And so this is something to kind of help uh, support him uh, during this downturn to make sure he's got uh, some business uh, to keep him, keep him afloat. But without further ado, uh, allow me to introduce our very special guests, uh, my good friends, the Sahakians, joining us from London. Um, you know, Eddie and uh, Edward Sahakian, two commensurate gentlemen. I don't think there have ever been two finer gentlemen in the tobacco industry since Zeno uh, Davidoff himself. And um, can you guys hear me? We can. Ah, yeah. Great. Hello from London. You made you made me nervous there for a second because we have been plagued with uh, various audio issues, you know, during these live streams. <laughs> I was uh, about to start throwing things, but luckily that won't be necessary. So. And you see us okay, Kirby? Is Dad and I both here? Yeah, I think you guys are perfect. So that's great. And mm -hmm. you know, why don't you let us all know kind of where you're joining us from? Of course, properly socially distanced, but uh, you guys are together, and it's great to see you. Of course. Well, we're, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I've been invited into my father's smoking room, which is in, in London, in, in his house. And you might notice a few pictures around us, and there's a, a, a bevy of famous smokers, but none more so than, than my father, who I always enjoy smoking with. And we're here. Uh, very excited to, to be talking with you, Kirby. And and thank you for giving us the opportunity to dress up and uh, get together, uh, even virtually for a thing. Well, yeah. you know, this has been created by my wife for me. Uh, not that I could only smoke here, I could smoke any place in the house. Matter of fact, Greta, she encourages me to smoke anywhere, particularly when we sit in front of the TV and watch our favorite program. However, she said I wanted to have a room which is dedicated to you, especially where you could sit and smoke, surrounded by my lovely humidor, cigars, photographs, and occasionally the presence of Eddie and some dear friends who come here. Yeah, well, that's great. I think being able to smoke indoors is the most civilized way to smoke. And, um, you know, it's uh, increasingly difficult to really find a place indoors to smoke. Uh, and, and not just indoors, but at home to smoke. And so it's really marvelous uh, that you've got such a beautiful uh, place to smoke. And I wouldn't expect any less from you. Uh, of course, one of my favorite places to smoke uh, is in London, 
um, whenever uh, I'm there at the Davidoff of London store. And uh, you know, we've just got a quick little uh, video. This is, of course, Davidoff of London, right on the corner of uh, German Street and St. James's Street. And um, you know, one of my favorite things to do whenever I'm in London, of course, is to stroll into the shop and um, you know, walk into your beautiful humidor, have uh, one of you, of course, help me select a cigar and then enjoy it in good company. And so actually right now I'm supposed to be in London. Uh, I was going to be flying there uh, actually yesterday uh, for the World Championship of Shoemaking, for which I'm a judge. And unfortunately, of course, due to the pandemic, that's been canceled. So this is the next best thing in the absence of actually being able to travel and enjoy a cigar with you guys is to be able to at least do this virtually. So uh, thank you so much for the honor and the privilege uh, of your good company kind of uh, during these kind of just crazy times. Well, for sure. Kirby, how, how is your family? Everyone is well, everyone is safe. Yeah, you know, luckily we are all safe and healthy. Uh, Dallas uh, is totally shut down, but uh, relative to like, you know, of course, New York and other places, I mean, you know, we really don't have that many uh, coronavirus cases. Um, it's really probably more at this point out of just an abundance of caution. I think the most challenging bit of this all to me has been uh, my newfound role as a uh, homeschool teacher, uh, because uh, three to four hours every single morning I'm homeschooling my children. I was you know, doing that this morning and I was, as I was driving to work thinking of just how much I really needed a drink because, uh, you know, Friday, the last thing the kids really wanted to do was uh, their long edition and, you know, kind of uh, uh, other homework. So I was going to drink my normal kind of cranberry juice and sparkling water, but whenever I saw you two sit down and kind of pull out uh, your favorite beverage of choice, I said, you know what, I, I can't do that on a Friday. <laughs> well, can I use that as an opportunity to toast your Good health to you, your yeah, family, you. and of course all the, all the viewers virtually. Good and health and stay safe. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, how are, how are you all doing? I mean, of course, it's particularly difficult in London. I mean, you guys are totally closed down, aren't you? Mm. Yes, um, you're absolutely right, Kirby. It is. Um, you know, all businesses, and um, unlike Spain and a couple of other European countries, Cigar shops were not deemed essential businesses. So, you know, in America, <laughs> the alcohol stores are, have been deemed essential. So I can't, I mean, it's like, you know, if we weren't so political correct these days, I think a tobacconist should be essential also. I mean, do you guys sell alcohol? I think we are, but you know? not many people recognize that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we, you know, we've been lucky to, to have at least uh, some mail order business and internet business which uh, has grown during the shutdown, but nothing beats the physical store and the experience of visiting a cigar shop and, of course, welcoming your customers uh, in person. You know, that's really, uh, it, it, it's been a big miss for all of us. But we know we'll come through the other side. Um, I mean, my father has been very well behaved, I have to say. Yeah, yeah you've well, still been going into the shop. Out of the house. Yeah, it well. is strictly talking to not to leave the house, don't come to the shop. Don't go out. Uh, my only consolation is, of course, a good cigar, good food, and the company of my wife. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I've met your wife, and she's a very lovely, so you probably can't, you're Thank definitely you. not doing bad, you know, with that right there. <laughs> now, of course, I mean, uh, Eddie, of course, I mean, I think one of the most beautiful things about Davidoff of London, of course, is being able to actually go select a cigar in person. Uh, but you, you kind of briefly mentioned, I mean, you guys do have a website uh, that people can still purchase uh, over the internet, and I think what you're going into yes. the shop, what, once or twice a week to ship those orders? Uh, yes, actually, exactly right. Our, our website is www.davidofflondon.com, and uh, I go in with a colleague of mine five days a week, Monday through Friday, okay. yeah. uh, for a relatively limited time frame, about four or five hours, and we, do, we pack up all the orders, we take any telephone inquiries, and uh, get to the post office in time to, to ship them out and, you know, knock on wood um, and, you know, big credit to the, the postal and delivery services. They still seem to be working and without them, I think uh, society would be far worse situation than it currently is. Yeah. Uh, so we're very grateful. For that. They've certainly been tidying us over. And are most of your shipments just kind of domestic within the United Kingdom or do you guys do much business yes, over they the are. internet outside? No, it's, it's oh, UK only uh, for, for shipping tobacco, and that's uh, there's a few legal hurdles 
around that, and um, uh, unfortunately, we haven't overcome them yet. So, uh, yeah. I wish I could yeah. send it uh, through the website to the U.S., but uh, we can't do that at the moment. Well, then I guess you know we should just um, you know as soon as these uh, travel restrictions are lifted, you know, uh, get on to London and uh, buy a cigar properly. So, you know, let's. Uh, I don't want to get in the way of us and a good cigar. There's plenty of us to talk about and um, or plenty to talk about, but let's do it, you know, smoking, you know, as a proper gentleman would. And I know that there's something very special uh, that you guys actually have to share with us uh, that um, I'm really quite excited about. So, um, you know, why don't you guys go first and uh, I'll talk about what I'm smoking afterwards. Well, <laughs> what, what an honor for me because... Um, this is the first time we're showing this. It's um, a Davidoff 40th anniversary cigar to commemorate the upcoming 40th anniversary of the cigar shop in St. James's. Uh, we opened, or my father opened the shop on the 29th of May, 1980. And uh, unbelievably this year it will be 40 years. So about a year and a half, two years ago, we uh, spoke with Otina Davidoff in Basel, uh, the mothership, so to speak. And they were very keen to celebrate the occasion as well. So we gave them a, a, a relatively simple brief because the cigar my father absolutely loves and fell in love with at the beginning with Davidoff is the same one I love. Uh, and that's the number two size. Uh, yeah. A classic, what's called a Corona Especial, um, sometimes so it's, referred to as a Pacatella. And it's slightly it. larger than that. a normal Corona. Uh, only in length. Yeah. In, in ring gauge, it's slimmer. So this is a, a 38 ring gauge cigar. And um, may I offer you one, And it's... You may indeed. Um, in in, in the, the Cuban smokers, it would be known as a Leguita number no. 2 or a Corona Special. It's a 38 ring gauge and a 6 inch in length. And um, the box is quite special. There's only 300 boxes made of 10 cigars. We had a, a very uh, august and um, well-heeled committee, five or six people that we know very well, who were involved right at the very beginning, uh, tasting and sampling the blends along with my father and I. And we were able to narrow down the choices slowly and whittle it down to the, to the final choice. Uh, and then, of course, it was left in the hands of, of Davidoff and Basel. And I can tell you now, if you ever want anyone to make a cigar for you, or indeed design the packaging that goes with it, nothing beats Davidoff in Basel. They, they did a beautiful job with that. Um, the cigars themselves were physically delivered about a month ago to us here in London. And uh, whilst Dad and I have sneaked a, a previous tasting, we have not released it yet. And, um, and of course, we, we do believe in uh, the cigar settling a little bit, maturing, being ready for the consumer when they buy it. So we're going to let it continue to do that. Perhaps one of the silver linings of the, of the COVID. Um, and I can tell you a little bit about the blend. It's a Habano Ecuador wrapper. Beautiful, dark sheen, very silky, very smooth. It's held together through the binder, which is a San Andres Mexican. And the filler is a combination of four different Dominican tobaccos, including the Yamasa Dominican, which was developed some years ago, but is, is quite a feat of uh, genetic engineering by Henke Kellner. Uh, and it's created a, a very rich, spicy tobacco. Um, and of course, whatever we said about the cigar, ultimately, Henke Kellner and Eladio Diaz in Dominican Republic uh, were responsible for making it become a beautiful smoke. So. This is what presents uh, with us now. Uh, and it's a rather dark hope. wrapper. I mean, it's, it's much darker yes. than your average kind of white label Davidoff. Yes, exactly right. Uh, you occasionally will see the 702s. Uh, there's a series from Davidoff called the 702, which uses an Ecuadorian wrapper as well. Um, but I think it's quite a distinguishing feature and it adds a little pepper, a little spice uh, to the palate. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'm talking a lot and not cutting my cigar, so excuse me, I'll turn my shoulder to you for a moment. Well, you guys tend to your cigars, and then I'll, I'll reveal mine real quick. So 
given that this is a special occasion to be enjoying uh, your great company, I figured I would actually pull a cigar out that one is very special to me, but also makes me think of just uh, the pleasure of your company. Um, this is uh, the first box of cigars uh, that I purchased uh, from you two in London. Is the Hunters and Francao uh, Ramon Ayones, uh, what anniversario, the 225th anniversary of Hunters and Francao actually importing exclusively Cuban cigars into the United Kingdom. Can we get a can zoom on this, Christian? I don't know if you can, but this is a beautiful, very special cigar. I made the leap and actually bought a box of these uh, whenever I was in. Uh, that's not much better, but uh, we'll look at that. We'll, yeah, pull in on that. Just oh. so. And, um, you know, I haven't actually Delicious. spoken very many of these um, because it's such a special box. And the last time I was in London, you guys were very generous to uh, offer me a box of, uh, of the Lanceros, the Ramon Ayones also, weren't they? Um, oh, I know which one you mean. You mean the La Reina. No, La Gloria. El Rey del Mundo. It, That's was, right. El Rey del Mundo. El Rey del Mundo. And so I've been smoking those too quickly. So I said, you know what? I need to go up to my top shelf and pull out something else. So this is what I'm smoking today. <laughs> um, so anyway, well, back you, to you guys. Can, so, you, can I just say you've picked a cracker of a cigar there? You know, well, it's I'm, aged so well. I'm kind of afraid to smoke them. They're so precious now. Um, but, uh, you know, it's like uh, cigar futures. I'm glad I got in whenever I did. <laughs> I'm sorry. I went ahead and lit my cigar whilst you were describing your cigars. No, please. That's I, what I, I wanted. I've been waiting for this moment all day today. So it is said that don't smoke anything until we smoke tonight together. So, I couldn't resist anymore. Yeah, well, I don't blame you. So thank you for getting started. You know, it's it's, it's interesting, Kirby. I don't know if you've observed the same thing uh, in Dallas or, or in the U.S. market, but in the last two, three years, we've seen uh, a definite opening up of the slim gauge cigar market. And, you know, traditionally it was Robustos and Toros and, and very heavy ring gauges that were popular in, in most markets. But, um, but we're seeing a, a reversion to, to a, a format that was very popular 20, 30, 40 years ago. But these, you know, probably in the last 10 years, had really fallen out of fashion. Yeah. Well, that's funny. I it mean, was, yesterday I was smoking with class, and I had a, uh, like a 52-gauge Robusto. And, um, mm. I mean, it really, it, there was too much smoke on the draw, right? And so to really kind of to, to get it... Uh, to get it puffing, you were just, I mean, I was kind of drowning in smoke. And it just doesn't feel as elegant in the hand as a proper, you know, 42 or 38 kind of slimmer ring gauge cigar. I think that there's a true elegance to that. And, uh, you know, one of the things, of course, that uh, you two have, uh, have spoken about is that, um, you know, to me kind of in our conversations is that, you know, the slimmer ring gauge is actually much more traditional uh, than these uh, more kind of the recent phenomenon of these very thick ring gauge cigars. To be honest, I mean, with the larger ring gauges, that is quite popular these days. I find it a strain on my jaw after a while. Yes. Uh, sometimes I feel like I need to put an adapter on a cigar to, be <laughs> to smoke it. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit more about this 40th anniversary cigar because, I mean, 40 years is really, um, I mean, that's an exceptional career. Uh, to have in any business and of course you know you were the first uh, independently owned Davidoff store that they even allowed and uh, probably probably the only one that's still around is it I mean fully branded Davidoff store outside of, of Geneva I, I don't know but um, you know talk to us a little bit about this cigar I mean congratulations on 40 years first and foremost I mean you. you know cheers and to you, you Mr. Sahakian uh, and Eddie I mean and um, I mean, you guys have introduced so many countless people to find cigars that um, will just cheers to you to guys. Your good health. Thank you. To your good health and all your viewers, wherever they are. Yeah, so let's see who we've got. You know, we've got over 200 people with us right now, so it's a nice crowd from all over the world. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, we've got uh, several that are uh, enjoying a cigar with us, so we've got a nice kind of crowd right now. and. Um, you know, we've got great viewers on this channel. I must say that they all share the same passion for quality craftsmanship and tradition. And it's, it's those 
uh, those just values that I think a cigar captures so much. Because I've, I've never found someone with whom I've smoked uh, who I didn't at least share uh, some similar values to. And I think that's one of the beautiful commonalities of a cigar is how they really kind of bind those together. I mean, anyone that's going out of their ways to smoke a cigar is really kind of self-selecting uh, themselves into a particular kind of way of life. And um, it's a beautiful thing. Well, it's a bond of friendship. It, it brings people together. It brings uh, fathers and sons together as we are. And I, I could point out so many friends, customers, the amount of time they say that, you know, I sat down and smoked my, my son, he smoked his first cigar with me. And it was such a joy and a pleasure to do that. And that bond, once it's created, it stays forever. It really does. Yeah, maybe actually, you know, you, you make me think of, um, of maybe just as I think ahead to the years of actually, you know, making sure that Nathaniel's first cigar is smoked in London at the Davidoff of London store. That would be, you know, what a memory oh. that I would at least hold with me for the rest of my life. God willing, I will be there to see it as well. Yeah, God willing. Yeah, I'm sure you will be. Everyone's in good it health. It would be an honor for us. Please, please. Uh... Book, book, you don't have to book it, it's reserved for him. Yeah, reserved. <laughs> Put that down in the, uh, in the universe, uh, that is uh, for certain. So talk to us a little bit about this cigar. So, I mean, you were speaking a little bit before we came on about how this particular format and really everything that went into this cigar is significant in some historical uh, way of just kind of your story, uh, Mr. Sahakian. So uh, would you mind just kind of sharing that with all of us? Because I really would love to hear it. Well, well, my first love with the Davidoff cigar was when I went to the <coughs> Geneva shop. Oh God, it was 72, 73 perhaps. And I walked in there and said, I want a cigar. An elderly gentleman, not very old, but an elderly gentleman came up to me and said, what are you looking for? I said, I don't want anything too strong. I've had one or two cigars and I find them too strong. He said, ah. Well, I knew exactly what we would enjoy. And he came back with a box of the Davidoff number two and showed it to me. He actually took one out, he cut it, and he said, try it. And that was the first time I smoked my Davidoff number two. And it was love at first sight. Uh, who was that gentleman, by the way? Uh, that gentleman was Zeno himself. Yeah. Zeno oh, that, wow. I didn't even know who he was. After I finished and everything, and whilst I was paying and getting ready to leave the shop, somebody else came to me, oh, we miss you, Davidoff. I said, oh, God, this is <laughs> <laughs> So what was the occasion? I mean, were you in uh, Geneva for, um, for business? Uh, I was there for business. I was actually transiting. I was passing through Geneva, coming to London. Uh, you know, I'm originally from Iran, so I used to live there. We had some other businesses, and because of our business, did bring us uh, to London because the head office or the international head office for Coca-Cola uh, was based in London, so we used to do several visits here. But on the way, the connection was with Swiss Air, and it, I always enjoyed staying in Geneva for a day or two. One of the reasons turned out afterwards to be that I used to pick up my cigars. Uh, and uh, it, well, I was just a, a visitor there. It was quite interesting. Uh, that night I smoked the second one of those cigars. And so when I took the box back, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was more than a box, it was a few boxes. <laughs> and from there on, it just went on forever, really. It was my f love for, for, at the first sight with that cigar. And then uh, I, I mentioned this story already, but uh, many years later, when I'd opened the shop, and Eddie, he was uh, at the age of 15 and a half, 16. I was legally 16. Yes, legally 16. <laughs> One morning after he'd gone to school, my wife came screaming to me, look what I found in his pocket. I said, what have you found in his pocket? I thought it was a gun or a knife or what. I said, look, 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 look. There's a lighter in this pocket. <laughs> and there was a zip or light. I said, well, it's a lighter. Said, no, 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 he, he must be smoking. He shouldn't smoke. He, he's too young for these things. I said, well, don't worry. I'll have a word with him. And 
in the evening when Eddie came from school. It, it might even be like on a Thursday or a Friday. I said, Eddie, Saturday morning, you have to come to the shop. I need to talk to you. Uh-oh. So, he Eddie, I'm sure you person. remember that. Uh-oh. What did I do? <laughs> <laughs> and Saturday morning around 10, 10, 30, he came to the shop and said, Dad, yes, so what did you want to tell me? I said, well, sit down. I have something for you. You know, on those two chairs, which we often sit there, as you know, he sat down there. I went into the cigar room, came back with a David of number two. I cut it, I lit it, and I gave it to him. I said, Eddie, take the cigar and smoke it right now, all of it in front of me. Oh, Dad, no, I don't smoke. I said, I know you smoke, and your mother is very upset. <laughs> and therefore, you're going to smoke it. If you're going to smoke anything in your life, you might as well smoke the best. Here you are. And that was his first cigar, and I'm so proud I was the one who gave him his first cigar. And I think he appreciates that. And we're playing, uh, we're hoping and uh, waiting for a day where we could play the same scenario on his son Elvis. <laughs> the same I think my daughter Stella is the one more likely to be doing naughty things. <laughs> and so that box I mean, there, I mean, that's so that box. I mean, is that one of the original Davidoff number twos from Cuba? I mean, is that kind of a yeah, Bring that, that up that, to the camera. Can we see that? There. Of course. Um, you know, I don't know if the focus is okay, but... Yeah, um, um, you know, the resolution is not amazing, but uh, we can still see it. So is, is there anything left in that box, or is it just a relic? Oh, of... yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a full box. Oh, you're kidding. And the, the reason it's a full box is, well, you know my father very well. He's, <laughs> he's a hoarder. The best and of us are. Absolutely. A hoarder and hoards the finest things, uh, usually. You know, Eddie, we're, we're, we're called collectors. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> tell him, Dr. Harvey. Tell him. <laughs> yeah, I've, got a, I've, got a, I've got a dear good friend that I always accuse of being a hoarder, and he jokes. He says, no, 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 I'm a collector. I said, no, you're a hoarder. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, in this moment in history, with everything we're facing, uh, hoarders have come to the fore, haven't they? Uh, yeah. Any, anyone who had anything in, in the larder was considered a hero. Yeah. So, um, so this is one of the original, you know, Davidoff. I mean, this is, uh, uh, you know, Cuban cigars, number two. Uh, and then, you know, so it seems like this particular format, the number two, just has a special kind of, um, you know, sentimental significance to you. I mean, is that right? Mm. It, it's very sentimental. It, it, it brings back such nice memories always. And whenever Zeno used to come to London to visit us, he always came with a box of 25 of the David of number twos for me. Yeah. Uh, I wish I'd kept them all. I used to open it and smoke it there and then with yeah. him. But it, it's very sentimental. And then some 15 years ago, we were celebrating the 25th anniversary of the shop. It was in the year 2005, and uh, again, uh, Davidoff was very kind to Dr. Schneider. He said, Edward, we have to make a special cigar for your 25th anniversary. What would you like us to make? I said, please, can we have the same format as the number two? And again, we went through the same procedure with Eladio. He made several samples, and he sent them uh, to London, he tried them, sent them back, made a few comments. But these cigars went back and forth probably three or four times. And then the last batch that I get, it was just delicious. Uh, I called them, uh, Eladio. I said, Eladio, please, this is exactly what we would like. Can you make these? Said, of course I can. So they made these beautiful, again, boxes of 10 of the Davidoff anniversary of 1980-2005, which very similar to, as a format, but slightly lighter in color. So is that the 25th anniversary right there? This is the 25th anniversary one, yes. It's That's only amazing. 15 years old, this box, but I'm going to keep it for a little while. <laughs> yeah, never, never, never mind that, that label. It seems to uh, clearly not be uh, total, totally factual. Well, listen, these cigars. days everything kills you. Hasn't killed you yet? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so then here we are on the, um, you know, the 40th anniversary. So the 25th was a lighter wrapper, and then this one you went something a little bit more peppery. 
And, uh, you know, what was just kind of your thinking? I mean, how did that evolve, um, that conversation of the blend? Because that's so important to, you know, just, you know, the essence of a cigar. Uh, if, if I may uh, add uh, to that question, um, my, my, my favorite Davidoff in recent years, in the last 10 years, actually not even Davidoff, my favorite cigar in the top three probably, was the art edition Davidoff that they produced uh, initially in 2014 and with a tweaked blend in 2016. The 2016 hit me profoundly. I love this cigar. Everyone who smoked it agreed. And when we were talking with Davidoff about this 40th anniversary cigar, um, we started with a brief. I said, can you create the 2016 art edition blend in a number two size? Mm. So they went away, scratched their heads, thought about it, and then they came back and said, look, it's physically impossible. We're missing some of the tobaccos, but also the, the ring gauge of the 2016 Art Edition was much wider. So you could physically fit much more into it. The number two you know, is a very difficult cigar to, to blend in a complex fashion because of the limited ring gauge. However, we're going to try. So off they went and they came back and this is where it really started. Um, we tasted, I think it was six blends that had been variants of the art editions from 14, from 16, um, with a few tweaks. And um, I think it was a very close call. There were two cigars at the end. One which was a much lighter, uh, more gradual development cigar and one which was spicier, richer but which had a really interesting development, which is the one we're smoking now. And I think between my father, myself, and, and, and the group, that we had a sort of a tasting group of, of six or seven friends and like-minded aficionados, we all agreed that as a smoke, this is going to keep you interested. This is the one that's going to de develop better. We think the aging potential on this cigar, we hope, will be 15, 20, 25 years. Yeah. Um, already it's delicious, but if you can be patient, we hope it's going to be, you know, <laughs> maybe for the 80th anniversary. <laughs> Even better. That's amazing. So we have a photograph of the art edition right here. Um, so this is, uh, of course, uh, what format is that? What did, what did you call it again? I should know that, but uh, I don't. It's a, it's a perfecto. It's essentially perfecto, a perfecto. Of course, yeah. um, tape it on two ends and, and um, you know, we, there was, it, probably 10 years ago, there was some debate about the differences between Cuban and, and non-Cuban cigars, especially Dominicans, the Aragans. And I think the overriding commentary was that people thought or felt that the Cubans would be more complex when you smoke them. But the Davidoff special editions, certainly the ones in the last several years, have blown that premise out of the water. I mean, I've, I've smoked some extraordinary Dominicans, beautiful Nicaraguans now, that give you all the development and narrative in a cigar. You know, I don't think anyone likes a boring uh, smoke. No. Uh, if you have a conversation and everyone says the same word a hundred times over, it's boring. Yeah, it has and if to you overage, you can do that. I mean, I had, I bought a, um, gosh, what did I get? It was a Lancero uh, from someone else. So after that box of Lanceros, the, uh, was El Rey de Mundo. I went searching for other boxes of Lanceros, and I, I think I was able to acquire like a 2006 or something. And it was overaged. I mean, it had no flavor. It was a totally flat, dead mm. cigar. Yeah, the, the, that, that's, that's the magic of cigars. You just don't know. Uh, you can guess, and you can make an, uh, an educated guess on which ones will age beautifully. But, I mean, my, my father taught me very early on um, the right way to try and make sure the cigar stays in good condition. But really, it's, it's, it's in the hands of the gods, no? Well, yes, I mean, it's, it's something magical to it. You know, we've seen it so many times. The cigar comes out to be very boring in the beginning. After a while, it gets better, and then it nearly dies. And then just when you think it's dead, suddenly it opens up and turns into a beautiful, delicious cigar after a number of years. Of course, it's very important the way you keep it, how you keep it, the, the temperature. Uh, as you know, you know, we keep it at 
for long storage, I always sort of like to keep the cigar at a lower temperature and uh, slightly lower humidity. And this enables the cigars to slowly and slowly ferment and mature in good time. It's, it's a bit like a slow cooker, yeah. and it turns out to be delicious. Mm. Yeah, we were speaking yesterday with class, uh, you know, from Davidoff, uh, from, you know, the, the Kellner family who actually, you know, grows much of the tobacco that you guys uh, use in the Davidoff mm -hmm. cigars. And his father, of course, um, you know, you guys said was instrumental in kind of development of this particular blend. And uh, he was saying that you guys have a very particular, very unique approach towards aging your cigars. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit? Could you elaborate just on that? Because it's one of the things that's very special about purchasing a cigar from Davidoff of London, of course, is the provenance of knowing uh, that all of the cigars have been properly aged and really uh, skillfully aged. Uh, and it really does accent the cigar quite nicely. Mm, come on, indeed. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, only, I'll only add to, 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 to the genius. You know, my father will never say it's genius, but, but I think it is because uh, back in the 80s, um, they, my father took the view that if you want a cigar to, to improve for a very long time, um, you need to tweak some of the conditions that, you know, up till then people had spoken about humidity at 70, relative humidity, and temperature probably closer to 18 to 20 degrees centigrade, or around 70 Fahrenheit. Um, but my father disagreed with that and said, actually, cigars improve over a longer period of time at a lower temperature, closer to 12 centigrade, and at a lower humidity, somewhere around 65 relative humidity. And of course, we had no way of testing that. There was no, no way, you just had to be patient and this all took, you know, was instigated in the early 80s. So, of course, by the time I became very active in the business, uh, initially in the early 90s and then again after 2008, um, I could test the fruits of that labor. And the cigars that we had aged with 15, 20, 25 years of age had so much personality still. They had character. They smoked. Uh, like a younger cigar, but, uh, but, but you could taste that there was vintage problems there. Um, so, of course, that's it. Um, in a nutshell, lower temperature and lower relative humidity. Um, and, of course, don't disturb the cigars. You know, it, it's a little bit like wine. Uh, you have to put them away and, you know, just forget about them. Yeah, you have to talk to them from time to time. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is that right, Dad? Uh, I think no, that's absolutely. No, that's very true. Uh, uh, with the cigars, there are cigars that I haven't touched for years. And uh, even when Eddie comes to me, so Dad, look what I found. I said, well, first of all, what you found has never been lost. <laughs> it has always been there. Uh, leave it. So, no, no, I want to see what's inside. I said, well, if you want to, but be very gentle with them. And it, it is very important. Cigars, they're resting there. It's very slowly maturing, and they don't like to be disturbed. You shouldn't really open it up, take it out of the box, play around with it. And uh, the consistency of the temperature and the humidity should not change. That is yeah. probably one of the most important factors. And that's what's real special happened. about what you guys have in London is, of course, you've got your cellar there in the middle of St. James's that um, in so many ways, I mean, cellars in London and France have been... Uh, you know, perfect for uh, having the conditions to age wine. And you're basically, you know, kind of stealing from that in order to age cigars. And it's one of the things that's real special about, again, buying a cigar from Davidoff of London is the fact that you guys do have the selection of cigars that have been so perfectly and masterfully aged. Uh, that's very kind words, Kirby. Uh, and we're, we're, we're happy that, uh, the, you know, that you appreciate that. Um, for us, we love them as well, but, but the proof is in the, is in the pudding. So we, we, we don't know until our customers agree with us. Otherwise, uh, what could we say? Yeah. So speak to me a little bit about, um, you know, again, you know, which stock at the store in London are aged? Because don't you have a special kind of reserve of uh, Davidoff aged cigars? It's a special band that you have on a small little reserve collection. Um, can you speak a little bit about that and 
um, kind of where that would come in? Yes, um, I think you, you're, you're, you're talking about the, the Sahakian private reserve. Yeah. And um, you're absolutely right. We, we created the, uh, essentially a, a logo which represents my father, Edward Sahakian, and we did that at the time in 2012 because we, uh, were in, we became involved in a lounge project with the Bulgari Hotel in London and they couldn't use an existing brand. So we thought it was a nice time and a nice way to, to celebrate everything my father has achieved in, in cigars. So the brand came into existence there, but um, I had the idea that many people know not so much we're Davidoff of London, of course they know us as Davidoff, but many, many of our collectors know them as Edward Cigars. Ah. And I thought, well, if that's the case, why don't we just call them Edward Sahakian Private Reserve to show that they've been in his lockers, which is exactly where they are. Yeah, uh, amazing. Almost every vintage cigar that comes out of our keep, either gets sold or enjoyed or shared, is really my father's personal stock. Uh, he gets very upset and angry every time one box <laughs> gets sold. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a very dangerous business selling a cigar. <laughs> Mm. Uh, so I get emotionally attached to my cigars. You know, I mean, and I can relate to that 100%. I mean, I've got my humidor, and I think that there's, I mean, smoking a cigar, of course, is a ritual, and it's a special occasion. And, I mean, every cigar I smoke, I really relish. I mean, I don't take a, any cigar I ever smoke for granted. Um, I mean, it's, whenever I do so, it's a special exception. I don't have that, you know, it's not something I do daily, even weekly, for that matter, to be quite honest. And... Um, you know, whenever I smoke a cigar, it's special. And then I've got my humidor kind of over my left shoulder here that, um, you know, that I have really taken to aging a stock of cigars so that whenever it comes time to smoke, I know that there's a little bit of age on them. Uh, they're really special. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it kind of heightens that experience even more. But uh, real quick, so we've got a little bit of a surprise for you guys. Uh, we brought on someone else. Uh, to uh, congratulate you on uh, oh, no. your, your 40th anniversary. <laughs> so we've got the, the Kellners uh, from, from the Dominican Republic, a father and son also, kind of really following in your tradition. And, of course, these two gentlemen were uh, very uh, intimately involved in the, in the creation of your 40th anniversary cigar. So I, th I thought it'd be fun to bring them on to, um, you know, to join us for this smoke. Thank you for the beautiful cigar, thank you. Thank you, thank both you of you so much. You know, we, we, we would be nothing without the countless. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you. I have a, a photo uh, with you and me in my, my home. Yeah. With uh, Ed, uh, we had some we lovely times together. together. We will do it again. We will do it again. Well, I so, think we, we need to come and visit you in Dominican Republic with these cigars and we smoke them together. Yes, yes. For Yamasa. Yeah. <laughs> rapper, Yamasa rapper. So what, so, uh, um, Class, I mean, what are you guys smoking right now? So this is Class Kellner and his father, uh, Mr. Kellner, who, you know, I mean, essentially uh, was the first point of contact whenever Davidoff switched from Cuban to Dominican tobacco. I mean, a titan. I mean, a, just as much of a legend in the cigar industry as the Sahakians. And really, I mean, I think even more special, uh, a, um, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a family dynasty. I mean, these are two family dynasties right now, kind of in the tobacco industry, uh, being brought together in this live stream. And uh, the Kellners, of course, you know, helped to create uh, and, and really uh, manage and operate uh, the Davidoff factory in the Dominican Republic that, that rolled the cigars that you guys are enjoying right now. So we are oh, actually, much. we're enjoying the Davidoff Yamasa right now, so Robusto. And, um, mm. yeah. It's the, the cigar that comes from the, our, our family, from our tobacco farm. And if you guys were it's tuning in yesterday. It's a cigar that comes from your heart to our heart, and we love yeah. it. Thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, the amount of work put into that farm is ridiculous. So I call him hard-headed or stubborn, but 
he never gives up, and that's why this cigar is available for everybody now. That's amazing. It, it's a beautiful, beautiful tobacco and a beautiful cigar. We didn't think you could do it, Henke, but you did. <laughs> Nobody thought he could do it. The whole, the whole country was crazy. Why do you keep trying? Even my family was like, why do you keep trying? No tobacco grows there. And I mean, after about six years, they finally started like working out. And I mean, now we're like in our crop 15? 16. 16. 16. 16 crop. 16 crop. This is the best crop ever. The best yeah. crop ever this year. Well, I've got to, I've got to uh, you know, somehow twist an arm to put a box of those aside for me then because I'll add it to my humidor along with, uh, you know, the, uh, the Davidoff 40th anniversary, uh, Davidoff of London 40th. Um, well, Kirby, can I suggest something? You put, you get two boxes. You get two boxes, one of them you enjoy, the other one you keep. <laughs> and I promise you it will get better and better. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not quite there yet, uh, but... Uh, you know, one of these days, uh, you know, that's, that's the idea and the intent. So anyway, well, I thought it'd be fun to bring them on and just kind of say congratulations to you guys because I know that the Kellners, of course, you know, you guys uh, are, are know very well and they're our dear close friends of yours. And, uh, you know, we had them on yesterday and we knew that uh, we'd be able to, to hopefully catch class who I know is actually, it looks like you haven't moved for like three days. <laughs> well, I'm actually going to jump on another live on Davidoff Cigars in, a, in just a moment. So I was actually ready to do something like this. And then you called me like, would well, you hey, mind? Like, of course, man. Well, thank you for taking a few moments to, uh, to join us. And I was telling the Sahakians that, uh, you know, we, we can't be physically, but at least this is the next best thing. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you to your good health, your families, to all of you. Stay safe and healthy, and smoke a cigar. <laughs> and smoke a cigar. It's actually, it's a very important thing. Yeah. Okay, guys, see you guys later. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for having us. Ciao. Very much. That so the Kellers, I mean, there you go. Thank you, Kirby. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's amazing, Kirby. You're, you're a magician. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that came together really quickly, I must say. Uh, that was a, literally a spur of the moment. So hats off to class for, uh, you know, answering my phone call as I muted my mic and called him and said, you know, can you jump on this real quickly? Uh, literally, lit totally unplanned, but uh, that worked out beautifully. And, um, you know, I think it really speaks, again, so much to just the com camaraderie and uh, the community of cigar smokers. I mean, you know, we are really so small in so many ways and, um, you know, so many hands and so many, uh, so many people's passions and talent, you know, go into the creation of a fine cigar. And uh, that's, that's one of the things I really love so much about a Great Smoke is, um, is just knowing that, you know, people's passions and really, you know, quality craftsmanship and tradition uh, are really poured into this. And this is the manifestation of not mass production, of not some fast fashion or something that is, uh, uh, that is uh, anonymous, but of actual people uh, that are really putting their time and energy uh, into creating something special for us to enjoy. Kirby, have you ever had the, the good fortune to visit the Davido factories in the Dominican Republic? You know, I haven't, and it's on my bucket list. <laughs> oh, you must do it. You must do it. You know, along with uh, the Habanos uh, Festival, which is another bucket list item for me, I know that, um, that you guys were just there, actually. It probably was your last trip. I mean, your last flight on an airplane was probably to Cuba we for the Habanos fortunate. Festival. We were yes. very fortunate. When we went into Havana, everything was normal. A week later, we're coming out uh, already at the immigration and in the check-ins. Everybody was wearing the masks, and we were surprised. Said, Why are they wearing masks? And we got onto the plane, and a few of the passengers were wearing, wearing their masks. Then when we got back to London, it just got worse and worse. And within a week or ten oh, yes. days, yeah. slowly everything started to stop. We were very lucky to make it and come back and stay safe. And that yes. was important thing. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, we, 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 we were a little bit concerned that, um, of course, COVID has affected everything and everyone. And um, we were concerned whether it would have an impact on on the uh, the harvest for for this year, both in Cuba as well as in Dominican and Nicaragua and other countries. 
But from what we've been told, um, the harvest took place before coronavirus really hit. So I think um, I think we're going to be okay going forward. Well, if the cigar is contaminated, it will automatically die once you lit it up and start smoking it. <laughs> And I think, and I think this is only my opinion. I'm not a doctor or anything like that. But I think that uh, the smoke of a cigar, the tobacco smoke, does keep the virus away. Yeah, it's That's like an apple, opinion. an apple a day, you know, cigar a day. Uh, I mean, yeah. I think that, uh, you know, you, my father, you know, so many people I know that, um, you know, that enjoy and kind of a daily drink and a daily indulgence in a nice cigar. Maybe not daily, but at least a regular and frequently. Uh, if it if it isn't if there isn't some biological mechanism here that kind of keeps one healthy, there certainly is a, a psychological uh, value there, and um, you know to just helping one relax and uh, kind of uh, soften up a little bit, and that's so important to uh, I think just longevity is uh, being able to relax and kind of enjoy oneself. Uh, Kirby, may I ask what what are you enjoying with your cigar? What drink are you? Uh having that. You read my mind. So this is actually a, um, a very special bottle of uh, Maker's Mark Private Select. And actually, I'm going to grab this real quick because I need a, a little bit of a refill. Um, but uh, this is, um, this was a Christmas gift from my father. And uh, this is uh, Maker's Mark uh, Private Select. And, you know, I used to be a really big Scotch whiskey uh, drinker. And I find that uh, with age, uh, you know, the scotch can be a little bit, uh, a little bit rough on me the next morning. And so, uh, you know, kind of a Kentucky bourbon, it's a little bit sweeter, a little bit easier, not quite, I mean, this is 55% uh, alcohol, it's 110 proof, so it's not wow. certainly less alcohol. But, uh, you know, with a nice uh, cut crystal highball, which is, you know, to me, I think that the, uh, the accoutrement and uh, the aesthetic of smoking and drinking is so important. And uh, to me, uh, it would be almost um, sacrilegious to, to drink a nice whiskey or a nice scotch out of anything other than a proper cut crystal, like leaded crystal, uh, you know, highball with a, a single ice cube. And just the clank, I mean, I don't know if you can hear this, but just the, the, aesthetical, the aesthetic clank the auditory clank, the, the sound that that makes is completely different than in glass. And so, anyway, this is what I'm enjoying today. Uh, but why don't you guys, I mean, what are you enjoying? I mean, I'd love to, to learn kind of what you're uh -huh. drinking. Well, we have a slight difference of opinion between Eddie and myself. It's not a difference of opinion, it's a, a difference of taste. To me, I always enjoy something slightly on the sweet side of my cigar. And now I'm drinking a, a delicious rum. It was a bottle of rum. It is Club Havana, part of their anniversary thing, it's which I was given in Havana. Is it the Tributo? It is the atmosphere. The atmosphere. It's the Coricum atmosphere. And it's delicious. It's sweet. Uh, it just blends so beautifully with the smoke of the cigar. Uh, Eddie is <laughs> drinking something else. He will tell you what he's drinking. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm extremely fond. I mean, being born in Iran, where we're still Armenians uh, by heritage, and and I love the Ararat, what used to be called Ararat cognac, but technically it's a brandy. Um, and Ararat is is a very famous mountain for for Armenians. Uh, and the 20-year Nairi, it's called, is a sweet brandy. It's absolutely beautiful with, with a cigar, especially one which has peppery, spicy notes, like the one I'm smoking. And um, uh, there is a very long, interesting story that intertwines with, with of course, Winston Churchill, who uh, is very much part of the Davidoff brands as well now. And uh, I think the story goes that uh, Winston Churchill was introduced to this brandy by Stalin in Yalta, is that right? Yeah. And he became a diehard uh, fan of, of the Ararat brandies as well. So uh, it's very difficult to find in England. Uh, it doesn't seem to be imported. Uh, we're very lucky that a few visitors have brought these for, for me uh, from Armenia itself. And um, I love it. It just works good, beautifully well. 
Mm. Let me pull up a quick photograph. This, uh, this Ramona Ayones is really warming up quite nicely. This is a photograph right now, and you can see oh. it's really developing. What a beautiful cigar, my goodness. And a very special box, of course, that I still can place myself uh, back in the store whenever I purchase this. And uh, gosh, there was a, I mean, I don't want to say six sticker shock, but it certainly is one of those. It's like, you know, I definitely was spending up, you know, to, uh, to acquire this box. It was a little bit of a leap of faith. I think it's the most, most money on a single box of cigars I've ever spent. And uh, man, how grateful and thankful I am uh, that I did so because you you know, know this, what, you know what this right says. now is um, ugh, it's so sublime. Mm. Zeno would have said, smoke, but don't smoke too much. One a year out of that box. And uh, that will keep you going for a number of years that way. <laughs> yeah, well, I think and that there, is, that's about the pace that I've, uh, I've been smoking out of this. I mean, uh, I mean the box is uh, really almost totally full and uh, a truly special occasion cigar for me. And I couldn't be any more thankful. Kirby, not, not, not to make you feel even more uh, profound uh, with that cigar, but I can say uh, in February when we were at the festival in Havanos, uh, a very, very dear friend of ours who sadly is no longer with us, Simon Chase, mm. uh, an absolute legend in, in the cigar industry in Cuba, in England and worldwide, he was a huge fan of Ramon Alones, and his family, the Chase family, they donated a humidor that has those cigars inside that you're enjoying. These. Or, but, yes. He donated a humidor for the festival charity auction, which took place on the last evening. And if I'm not mistaken, it went for $400,000? <laughs> 380,000 euros. 380,000 wow. euros which is as much about Simon as it is about the cigar, but you're, you're truly, you're smoking something extraordinary there. Well, I, I feel like I always am a, I'm a huge proponent of strategic acquisition, which, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, you've got to be opportunistic. You have to be uh, really deliberate in, your, um, in acquiring certain, investing, if you will. I would, even, I would even take it that far to say that it was an investment uh, whenever I purchased these. Uh, and something that uh, you know that with age, um, you know, not only will grow in kind of monetary value. I mean, I think the price of these cigars have easily doubled since I bought this, the, the box, uh, but oh, will grow with that. sentimental value. And I think that that, in fact, is the greatest currency is the sentimental value. Because whenever I smoke these, I mean, it's going to take me back to 2016, you know, whenever I was just beginning to travel to London more frequently. I mean, we probably had just met around then, I mean, maybe one or two years prior. And, um, you know, this to me uh, is truly priceless right now. You, you, you nailed it, uh, Kirby, very, very much so. Um, you know, we, we get asked uh, occasionally by customers uh, who see uh, an investment opportunity with cigars, like they do with wine or with whiskey and, and other collectibles. And the best advice, which I repeat because it's my father's advice, uh, is, is with a cigar, it is by far the best thing you can buy. Not because it's going to become more valuable. It may. But in a worst case situation, you're going to be surrounded by wonderful, beautiful things that you can enjoy yourself. Like the best art, you can always hang it on your wall. Yeah. A cigar, you can always smoke it and enjoy it. And it will take you somewhere that very few other things can do. Yeah, or tailoring. I mean, a beautiful bespoke suit, of course, right around the corner from you guys, Savile Row. It's just a small walk. Uh, you know, shoes right around the corner. You've got uh, Foster and Sons. You've got, uh, of course, George Cleverly. You've got uh, uh, John Lobb, which is on St. James's Street also. And I think that these things, I mean, I really am a true believer of the whole idea of, um, you know, the estate. This is a personal philosophy. Right, so an estate is kind of the noun for someone that uh, enjoys the finer things in life, if you will. And I feel like it is the greatest pursuit of a man uh, to really surround himself uh, with items of meaning. Not, not value, not luxury, not expensive, but items of meaning that whenever we're smoking something or I'm 
you know, cutting a cigar with my uh, El Casco cigar cutter or smoking, uh, you know, and using an ashtray that was given to me as a gift by a dear friend or, you know, drinking uh, out of a, a crystal that was my, my grandmother's pattern, uh, that we're surrounding ourselves with things that whenever we touch them remind us of just the richness of life. And I think that it is so much more important than label, you know, like an orientation towards labels. And so, you know, here we are, uh, uh, Edward, you know, Mr. Sahakian, in uh, your private smoking room. You know, you've got, you know, you've got the photographs behind you that kind of remind you of kind of your, you know, just your own experience and journey through life. And, you know, you're pulling out boxes of cigars that uh, aren't, you know, you're not saying, oh, look at how, you know, precious and, um, you know, expensive these are, but you're talking of the memories and just the emotional and sentimental significance of them. And I think that, you know, if you were to give us a tour of your house uh, or any Estes house, any gentleman's home, uh, he would really speak of the stories behind everything with which he's surrounded. And that to me is just something that's beautiful. And I think it's the greatest pursuit of a man's life is really the surrounding themselves of objects of significance and that they can enjoy that were really passionately and skillfully made. I mean, you know, this stroller, you know, that I'm wearing, I can think back to, you know, this story. I mean, this, this stroller, uh, I think back to one of my first trips to New York, and I met Tom Mahone and uh, Robbie Taylor, and he was wearing this exact outfit. I mean, he had a little bit of a different tie, and I just saw that on him, and I thought, wow, that, that is beautiful. And uh, it was the first bespoke commission I ever had outside of the United States. I, I saw it on him and I said, you know what, I want this for myself. And uh, you know, this suit, every single time I wear it, you know, really not only transports me back to that time in New York and uh, you know, the fittings I had in London, uh, but just also remind me of London itself because this is really kind of my suit or outfit of choice whenever I'm there. And it's just so much, I mean, there's just so much more to this than just clothing. And um, you know, cigars, I mean, a fine wine that you've aged, you know, where, you know, instead of just a single bottle, you bought a case or a few cases. And, you know, like you, what you were saying, uh, Edward, of, of smoking one Or cigar. a magnum. <laughs> yeah, or a magnum. And, uh, you know, those things, uh, I mean, I don't know, that to me, you know, whenever I think of what are the core values uh, of mine and what are the core values of what we represent here at Kirby Allison is quality craftsmanship and tradition. And uh, those, are, those are items that really have to be sought out. That's beautifully put, Kirby. I couldn't agree more. Well, the invitation is open to you and to your viewers anytime. Any of them will give us the pleasure and the honor to be here. They're welcome to come and sit here where we're sitting, and we can sit us uh, down here, smoke a cigar, enjoy it together. You will be all welcome. So well. Not to invite myself, I'll take that as an opening of an invitation, but I have to say it's a bucket list, it's a bucket list, um, it's a bucket list experience uh, for me uh, to really enjoy a cigar kind of in your private company. And I thank you so much for inviting us all in right now, you know, during this kind of pandemic uh, to, um, you know, to your personal home. And uh, you guys, of course, took time away from your families on a Friday night to allow us to enjoy a cigar. And that to me is just uh, so generous and so special. This was the highlight of, uh, uh, of this whole uh, situation. It, it gave us something to look forward to and I shall be watching the video time and time again and filling my time with this beautiful uh, view that we do. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about, I don't want to end this, right? I'm not, I wasn't converting for uh, an ending here, although it sounded like one. Uh, if you guys uh, still, I mean, do you still have, uh, you know, cigars left? Uh, to smoke. I mean, is this, uh, you guys aren't finished yet. Oh, we, could, we could continue talking. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. <laughs> so, thank you. So, uh, talk to us. Uh, so, let's go back to this 40th anniversary. I mean, how is it smoking? Well, mine is smoking delicious. It's really, I'm really enjoying it, especially washing it down with the rum. It's a beautiful cigar. We've been probably talking for about an hour, and I still have. A good one third of it left. It's a lovely cigar. You shouldn't really rush into smoking it very quickly. Take your time, like everything else. Uh, if you spend more time with it, you will enjoy it more. Um, and it is a beautiful, lovely cigar. It's delicious, ready to smoke now. And 
it can only get better and better with time as well. Mm -hmm. What about you, Eddie? Yeah, I, I, this has all the hallmarks of, of a cigar I love, um, which is the development, the narrative development. Uh, what I'm tasting now is very different to what I tasted at the beginning. Uh, the DNA runs through it, but I've had very distinct segments of the cigar. Started off with the pepper and the spice. It's developed through. It's quite gamey now. Uh, it's got some of the personality of a Bolivar almost, if I was to compare it to a Cuban. Um, but it's my it's favorite very, format. Oh, it, it's 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 a gorgeous smoke, and I always say, you know how good a cigar is, not by what you say about it, but by how close to your lips it gets before you put it down. And I'm not going to put this down until it's burnt my lips. So, <laughs> <laughs> what more do we want? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, this is um, this Ramona Ayones is. Um, I mean, this one of the things I love is. Um, you know, how a cigar evolves as you're smoking it. And, you know, as you're smoking a cigar, uh, you really get this cascade of flavors that develop uh, through the smoke. I mean, at least of a, a great cigar, I mean, the beginning uh, should be totally different from the end. And uh, this right now is just uh, so exceptionally smooth that, uh, again, I, you know, I, I'm almost smoking it slower as I go on, you know, wanting to really relish and savor uh, all the notes uh, of this Every puff smoke. gives a different story. That's the beauty of it. Uh, how would it, how would you consider its strength uh, curve you overall? The it's Ramon very, you're smoking. I think it's a very mild cigar. I mean, I don't know. I'm not I'm not a very good gauge at smoke and flavors. I have to kind of admit that uh, I'm not. My olfactory is not all that sensitive. I have a you know real hard time kind of picking up on different flavors and notes. But I can say that this particular cigar. Uh, is a really mellowing and it's smooth. I mean, it's a smooth cigar, and um, I have to say, it's, it's an easy smoke. You, you know, the I don't know if you're aware of this, but when that cigar was released in 2015, uh, unlike the majority of cigars which are produced in Cuba, then shipped over to the relevant markets and released, this one was really born in 2013. It was finished in 2013 and sent over to Hunters and Frankau, where they aged it very unusually. They aged it for two years mm. before releasing it in 2015. So you're probably tasting the, the benefit of that additional aging. Uh, you've, you've got a seven, if not eight-year-old cigar in your hand, um, and that says a lot about it. Oh, that's great. Well, uh, how thankful I am. It's really, it's a beautiful, marvelous smoke. So how long do you think something like this would age for? I mean, when do you think it would kind of hit its, its peak, if you will? I would say easily 20, 25 years, easy, if not more. Well, one a year, that should put me right around that same mark. <laughs> just about, just about see you through. Plus or minus, you know. Uh -huh. we, we might have a few we can share with you if you run out. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I think that this box has kind of been sealed, right? So this is a, this is a um, you know, really special memory. But uh, I've got to put my name on the list uh, for a box or two, uh, you know, following uh, Edward's suggestion of the 40th anniversaries. And I think that... Uh, you know, how many boxes did you guys have made? Because there's a lot of interest amongst those that are joining us right now and acquiring one. <laughs> so, can you put me at the top of that list? Well, of course. Um, you know, we, we have produced 300 boxes only, so that's 3,000 cigars. And um, we're going to do a little 300 later. 300 boxes? Year. Did I just hear that? 300 boxes. Wow. Boxes of 10. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, that's, I mean, 300 is uh, a really exclusive run of cigars. I mean, shoot, your friends and family list is probably 300. <laughs> well, well once, once we've put the ones aside for my father, that leaves us with about 20 boxes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's where you come in, Eddie, you know, sneaking in at night to, you know, take one onto the shelves. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, you know, once, once of course, you know, we're, our release schedule is in the hands of, uh, of God here because we'll see what the coronavirus plays, but we won't rush us into the market, but at the right time, 
uh, when the markets open up again, I hope, uh, we will be delighted to release it and, um, of course, delighted to share it. Uh, as you know, time is on your side when you're talking about cigars. The longer you wait, the better it gets. Uh, so we're not, we're not impatient. We're happy to, to, to be patient with that. So talk to me a little bit about your plans for this. I mean, will this be something that you'll uh, kind of, um, you know, put to rest for a few years before you offer it in the store? Or is this something that uh, whenever you open back up, uh, Lord willing, soon, that uh, this will be available to your uh, good friends and customers? Well, I, I think we'll make it available this year. I, I, I don't see us missing this year because of the anniversary. Yes, well, our official anniversary date that I opened the shop in on 29th of May, 1980. So any time after that, I think we should, if we're allowed to trade uh, then, we, we should start releasing it. And also, you want to mention the whiskey. Oh, yes. Uh, whiskey? Yeah, there's a, there's a yes. interesting whiskey as well. You've been holding back on us. <laughs> I didn't know well, this was a box set. Uh, about, uh, well, more than, it's probably over a year now, um, we have uh, some dear friends at, at Specialty uh, Drinks who are, uh, it's the Whiskey Exchange. People might know them as Whiskey Exchange. Uh, Sukinder, who is, who is the boss there, and, and he's got his assistant, Diego. Um, we started speaking to them early last year about doing a special bottling of a whiskey that would be, if not 40 years, at least uh, distilled in the same year we opened the shop, 1980. Amazing. And like, like magic, Sukinder pulled out a cask of Glenrothes that had been distilled in 1980, and by the time we bottled it, it was 39 years old. That was last year. So we expect probably end of April, early May, to have 170 odd bottles of that whiskey, specially made with, of course, our own uh, branding on that. And our idea is to make the first 170 bottles available uh, as a companion to the numbered box uh, it matches, so uh, you'll be able to get the, the whiskey and a box of the special 40th anniversary cigar uh, as a package. Um, but yeah, that will be a little later in the year. Wow. I mean, I don't even know what to say. I mean, it's, uh, I need to start, uh, I need to find my wallet right now because um, <laughs> you know, that is, uh, I mean, again, I just, I love the idea of these limited editions and not just limited editions. I mean, that's actually the wrong orientation. Uh, but these certain anniversary editions that uh, in many ways kind of cement these memories uh, and allow them to live forward, right? Because that's what this is about. I mean, you guys are celebrating, I mean, 40 just marvelous years in business right there. I mean, I, mean, I just think of that shop right there in the corner of St. James's Street and uh, German Street as being uh, really iconic in so many ways. I mean, you know, whenever I think of London and I just, I take myself back to just the memory of kind of walking the streets, uh, you know, kind of pivoting on the Davidoff of London store uh, is something that I, is so much a part of me of London. Um, you know, turning the corner, you know, Wilton's where we enjoyed a nice dinner together or lunch together, um, you know, having Franco's across the street where you guys are so often found uh, having breakfast. And, um, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, I don't even know what to say. And it's incredible. No, uh, you don't want to see German Street these days, Herbie. It's, it's so depressing. Every single shop is closed. On St. James's Street, German Street, Salvador, everything is totally closed. It's like a ghost town, but I'm sure it's the same all over. No, it's the uh, same. I mean, you know, with me, I kind of oscillate between different emotions of... Um, of just ambivalence and indifference to panic to uh, real just um, I don't know worry and uh, you know to me I think the some of the most poignant moments of kind of just the history that we're living through right now has been whenever I've been driving uh, you know say like in Dallas on the toll road or something uh, a road that's normally packed with cars you know anytime that there's daylight hours I mean there's a lot of traffic and, uh, you know, the past few times whenever I've been on it, to see it completely empty, you know, really just puts into perspective uh, just uh, what we're living through at the moment. And, um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of sad to me. I mean, all the small businesses, I mean, you guys are a small business, small family-owned business. I think in many ways, uh, I mean, of course, we're a small business. I mean, we're kind of in some ways uh, the most susceptible to moments like this, right? I mean, I mean, how long can we go without any revenue? I mean, luckily we're online and we're still able to operate a little bit. And you guys have your kind of online business and, you know, your, uh, your helpline of people calling in and saying, you know, I need a replenishment. But I think when all this is over, uh, which it will be soon, um, I, I hope that people really rally around at the small independent businesses. Uh, instead of purchasing something on Amazon, they go and purchase it directly from someone. Or instead of a large conglomerate, conglomerate they go to their local store uh, to support those people uh, as we all seek to recover uh, from this closure. And I think, I mean, I, I, of course, I think that the only parallel to this is World War II in kind of recent memory, where people were living through uh, such a prolonged time of hardship. And I think that, I even think back to London during World War II, there probably was more business activity because aside from, of course, you know, the, the air raids and the late night bombings, uh, life in London was allowed to continue and people were still transacting. Now, of course, life was anything but normal during that time. Uh, and that was uh, certainly eclipses in many ways the hardship that we're living through now. But I think from a small business perspective, this has probably felt even more difficultly. Uh, it's, it's very difficult, and then uh, on a very personal uh, point of view, it's like my grandchildren, Eddie's children, Elvis and Stella, uh, they come and walk through the street, and I have to look at them from behind the window and just wave at them and blow kisses. Uh, we're not even allowed to get near them, leave alone kiss them. Yeah. Well, I mean, my, my, um, my stepbrother just had their first child, and... Uh, you know, my poor stepmother, uh, who, uh, of course, you know, has, um, for her, it's her first kind of biological grandchild, has, for, has, has been required to basically see her through a window. I mean, you know, she goes to my, my brother's house and, uh, you know, they take the baby to the, you know, to the patio window or something, and she's not able to actually hold her. And um, I think, wow, I mean, how difficult that must be uh, for her and for all of us, you know, with this social distancing, and I mean, it's really, uh, it's really quite sad to be. I mean, I just don't even. I, mean, I'm I'm sure trouble, I have trouble processing it. These days will pass, and we'll gradually and slowly get back into our normal life again. Yeah. Well, I think that the, the, you know, the one consolation I have, especially, you know, looking to those in Europe who I think have lived through several hardships. I mean, you know, one of the things that we're doing to try to get through this. A pandemic is, um, you know, with these daily live streams to at least help connect us uh, to those people like, you know, like you guys, the Sahakians, and that um, in so many ways represent the normalcy of life. I mean, being able to walk into the shop, to smoke a cigar, to enjoy good company with friends. I mean, that to me is, is what I miss the most. And, um, you know, these live streams, I think, have at least been kind of my, my, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, what is it, uh, compensation, if you will, or my, um, you know, how I've kind of, at least for myself, tried to get through this is to say, look, I mean, so much in life has changed, but, you know, the one small thing that we can do is at least, you know, bring these experiences and the social connection uh, digitally uh, to people. And uh, that's been kind of how I've, uh, you, know, you know, not compensated, but uh, coped, if you will, that's the word I was looking for, coped through this. And uh, I think of, you know, we had several live streams with some people in Italy. I mean, Maglia Francesco, uh, which is the oldest umbrella maker in Italy. I mean, they've been in business since, you know, literally the 19th century. I mean, I think, I, I can't even remember the year, but 1853 or something, you know, really absurd like that. And, you know, I, I really find comfort in that and knowing that, you know, if, if a company like Maglia Francesca has been able to persist and uh, really survive you know, two world wars and, you know, the pandemic of 1918, you know, they can survive this. I mean, however bad we are, I mean, however bad this is, it's not as bad as any of that. And if they could survive uh, those uh, absolutely uh, just devastating and trying times, and then we can get through this. And I think it's important to keep a little bit of a historical context to ground us absolutely. in, in that, um, you know, that, that we'll survive this. And, 
you know, one day we'll look back at this and we'll, we'll read the history books and we'll think, yeah, you know, I really remember living through that because, uh, I mean, next to September 11th, I mean, this will be uh, so much woven into the fabric of this country is uh, a time of collective uh, struggle and strength. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I, I, the only thing I can add to that is whoever invented FaceTime, God bless him. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. At least it's kept families together. We could at least visually see each other and uh, days go by uh, just by talking on FaceTime and enjoying our lives as it is. Yeah. Well, enough of us. Uh, we've got a few people uh, watching. I mean, if you guys have any questions, those for the Sahakians that are watching right now, uh, by all means, ask those in the live chat. I'd be happy to relay those. Um, I want to be considerate, of course, with your time. It's what, pushing 8.30 right now in London. Um, but, uh, you know, to all those that, are, that have taken some time out of their day to join us, um, if you have any questions for the Sahakians, uh, please do ask it, and I'd be happy to relay those. Um, you know, until then, I'll bridge it with, uh, you know, what are you guys most looking forward to kind of once all this is lifted? Being with friends together. That's what I'm yes. looking for. Uh, of course, being with family, first of all, and next to that, being with friends again. I really look back uh, in the recent days and evenings, we've been going through old photographs, various photographs, places we've been, people we've been with, and uh, there are some lovely memories, and I hope the days will come back again where we could spend time with our dear friends, old friends, new friends, and create more memories. That's what I'm yeah. looking forward to. Yeah. Eddie? Uh, you know, I, 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 hope, um, I hope, of course, we come through this with, with health and, um, and we, we regain normality, but I do also pray that we carry over a little bit of the, of the extraordinary humanity that's been shown by so many people in this period. Um, not just friends, people you don't know, strangers. I mean, our health workers on the front line, um, you know, everyone has been brave enough to, to be out there in, in public, helping other, other people in, in society who need perhaps more help. Um, you know, that has been the most touching, call it silver lining, uh, to this period. And, and I hope that's not forgotten when we come out of this difficulty and people continue to remember that uh, what we have in common with each other is far more important than, than what differentiates us. Um, that's, that's my biggest takeaway from this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with that more. Uh, we do have a few questions. And uh, I think this would be a great way to kind of allow us to really uh, to bring everyone else into this, of course. And um, first question is that, I mean, do you guys have a favorite drink? I mean, you guys, of course, are, have already shared with us what you're drinking right now. Um, I mean, favorite cocktail or favorite libation whenever you come home from a long, long day or at the end of a, of a week? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Well... Favorite cocktail, mojito. I think that's my favorite mojito because every time I drink a mojito, it brings back previous memories. That's my favorite uh, cocktail. Uh, with a cigar, as I mentioned, either rum or port. Either one of them goes down beautifully. Uh, it's, it's also seasonal, but probably in the winter days where it's nice and cold, a bottle of port is beautiful, it goes down lovely after a nice meal. Uh, if you add a bit of a Stilton to it as well uh, and enjoy it. And uh, on a warmer day, a nice rum, as it is, maybe just a cube of ice in it. For me, that's my uh, favorite drink. And I'm, uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of a very well-made Bloody Mary. Uh, and not necessarily for a cigar, but just uh, my desert island cocktail would have to be a spicy Bloody Mary with, with a really big celery stick stuck in. You're a real <laughs> health conscious nut, aren't you, Eddie? Yeah, it's uh, all your well, vegetables. I, I, I think in a previous life I was a tomato because... <laughs> 
If it's not ketchup, it has to be Bloody Mary. <laughs> <laughs> so I take it you're a big fish and chips fan. I mean, you take, actually, I mean, I guess in Britain, you guys have mayonnaise with your fish and chips. <laughs> but, uh, well, you, you know, uh, we are. We are big fans of our fish and chips. Uh, you know, I, I go with my vinegar. I like a little bit of malt vinegar yeah. with mine. Um, but, you know, you know, it's funny. You talk about fish and chips. I mean, the simple pleasures of life, you know, being able to eat uh, the foods that you normally could in, in a restaurant. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have a long list of places I'm going to hit as soon as the lockdown is finished. Yeah. You know, what will be the first? What's the first, uh, what's your first meal post lockdown? You know, I think, I think it'll be a very close call between Chinese and possibly uh, cello kebab, which is Persian it's a Persian meat skewers served uh -huh. with rice. Oh, wow. And you, you really have to eat that in the restaurant to, to get the full experience. Hmm. Interesting. What about you, Kirby? What's, what's yours? Huh, gosh, good question. Um, I mean, I think it, you know, in Dallas we've got uh, Bilbo K, which is a beautiful little French bistro that uh, kind of was a transplant from New York that I really enjoy. They've got something called their Cajun chicken. Uh, with a small little shoestring french fries and uh, a nice little kind of butter uh, sauce and again it's a meal that I enjoy so often with friends whenever they come to Dallas it's really kind of my go-to restaurant that we'll go we'll go eat at um, so probably that um, and you know I just again I, I really kind of miss the fact that I'm supposed to be in London right now to be totally honest I mean I've got, of course, the trip right now that I was planning on, on being in London, and then I have another trip to book for the end of May uh, where I'm supposed to be there. And uh, I just, I think for me personally, um, what I miss the most and look forward to the most is um, we're going to be, it will be, you know, the ability to travel again. I just think of being in London, staying at my club, you know, right across the street from you guys, uh, being able to have a cigar at Davidoff of London, I go to Wilton's for some, uh, some, some Dover Soul, um, you know, maybe even enjoy your good company again, uh, being able to go to the Chapel Royal uh, for service on Sunday, uh, to have a proper English breakfast, to go to Paris. I mean, those are the things that for me are so, uh, that just uh, really fuel me and uh, fill me uh, with, uh, with richness uh, that I look forward to. Uh, so this will probably be the things that I miss the most. I mean, I've gotten a full serving of uh, family and children uh, during all of this, and uh, I think that's part of the <laughs> silver lining is, um, you know, I've spent more time uh, with my children uh, during this all uh, than I have really ever, and that's a lot for me because I, I have a real big family, man. I love my children just immensely, and I'd say that uh, for me, family is first and foremost first, and uh, work and kind of what we do here is always second to, to uh, the work I do with my, my children and my family. Uh, I've gotten a full helping of that, so, you know, maybe a little bit of binge traveling. Um, you know, I kind of, <laughs> I, I wonder what my next trip to New York will be like. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know when that will be or what it will look like, and I, I really kind of think about that. Um, and hopefully enjoying some good cigars uh, while traveling. Um, so... Uh, let's, another question, uh, what, I mean, so, uh, this is a question for Edward, I mean, a man that has lived a full life, I mean, you know, you grew up in Iran, um, you know, the Iranian Revolution, you know, you left and you kind of immigrated to the United Kingdom, and you left your family and businesses behind, uh, Davidoff of London really was a, a, so much of a byproduct of you being transplanted, uh, to a country that wasn't your own. And uh, I think in so many ways, you've become so much a part of the fabric of London and of the United Kingdom, and you guys are really iconic in so many ways. But uh, what are some of the just kind of pinnacle moments and pinnacle smokes and experiences that you think back of? And a cigar is kind of what triggers that for you, and it transplants you, uh, takes you back in time uh, to just, I don't know, a beautiful experience, a beautiful moment. Oh God, there's so many of them, uh, Kirby. There's so many memories I have. Uh, I suppose the, the one that really stands out the most and foremost 
is on the opening night when we had a, a lovely gala uh, cocktail uh, at the Dorchester Hotel. And afterwards, we had about 500 guests there uh, for the launch of the Davidoff of London shop and also the Dom Perignon cigar. And at that moment, when Zeno Davidoff went onto the stage with Baron Philippe de Rothschild, and they offered each other their product. So Baron Philippe de Rothschild, he poured a glass of Dom Perignon champagne and handed it over to Zeno. And Zeno lit up the Davidoff Dom Perignon cigar and gave it to Baron de Philippe de Rothschild. And they toasted each other. At the same time, everybody there, nearly 500 people, everybody was offered a cigar and they all lit up their cigars at the same time. It was one huge white blue cloud of smoke. And at that moment, I'll never forget. And from there on, there are so many lovely memories I have with close, intimate friends, with strangers, which I became friends. I have made so many friends in the course of these years, and they're scattered all over the face of Earth. I mean, uh, yesterday morning, we had a phone call from a dear friend of mine who used to live in South Africa. We met in London in the shop. He invited me to go there. We took the children as well. We did a safari there. And since then, he's moved from there. He's gone to Australia, and he was calling from Australia to see how we were. And we were remembering the lovely times where we used to sit in the shop or at his home, or at our home, and drink a nice glass of wine, have a meal, and then smoke a nice cigar together. I have friends in the States. I have so many friends in the States. I have friends in Europe, all over the world. It's just incredible. Yeah. It's one of the things that I really think is so special about your shop. There's a few things allow me to indulge. But, um, you know, again, this day and age and kind of the, um, you know, the time of globalism and, uh, you know, large kind of uh, multi-point retail stores, I think one of the things that I love about London is the fact that you have so many shops that are still, in many ways, owner-operated, if you will. And one of the things that I love about Davidoff of London is, you know, for the most part, you or, I mean, one of you, Edward or Eddie, are always to be found in the shop. If you guys are open, one of you are there. And I think that's one of the things that's very special is that it's not uh, just kind of an anonymous, uh, generic kind of shop that you walk into and you buy a cigar from someone that you'll never see again or that hasn't been there very long. Uh, but to be able to, you know, to see one of you and to, um, you know, maybe have one of you kind of help consult in the selection of a cigar uh, is what really makes that experience special and um, not to diminish any of the people that you have in your shop because they're all equally exceptional and talented at what it is they do and uh, there's so much uh, a function of, of just kind of your um, of who you are because uh, I mean the people in your shop I don't I mean everyone that I think back to that I was there the first time I went is still there Right. I mean, I, I think that one of the things that you guys must be tremendously proud of is the fact that you have a really tenured staff of people uh, that are able to build relationships and rapport with their customers. Uh, and then to be able to sit down in one of those two chairs that we filmed some videos at that, you know, are amongst probably our most highly viewed uh, and to have a cigar right there in the shop and uh, to take a little bit of time out from the, the hustle and bustle of London, uh, you know, to smoke a cigar. Uh, is uh, is so special and unique. You know, I have to I stop am. you there. They don't smoke cigars in the shop. We all sample a cigar. In the <laughs> sample, <shop>. yes, <laughs> yes. Not to not to, to get anyone in trouble. So it's sample a cigar uh, so that one might make a more informed purchase. And um, you know that that is. I mean, it's it's a rare breed uh, of shops that where not only are they still run by the same family that's run it for forty years, uh, but that you still find them there. And uh, I mean, that's it's like going to John Lobb and, you know, I mean, one of the Lobb brothers is always there. And you know that these family members are such responsible and in many ways such powerful custodians of tradition. Um, 
it's not lost on me as an American, and I'm sure that uh, in London maybe it's a little bit uh, kind of uh, forgotten in the background of the fact that there's a lot of these sorts of, sh of stores. Uh, but that's so special. It is, it is very special, Kirby. It's, uh, I think it makes all the difference. Where you go into a shop, you see a familiar face year after year after year. Uh, we've been very fortunate. I've been very fortunate from, from day one. I still have employees who joined me at the first year of opening of the shop, and they're still with me. Uh, in the course of years, we lost three of them. They literally almost died in the shop. You know, They work all their life there. Uh, and uh, I have a mix of young, middle-aged, and older ones like me in this shop as well. Yeah. So well covered for a number of years to come. Yeah, and I'm very to... happy that there's continuity with Eddie, and, and you never know, maybe with his son Elvis as well. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's great. I mean, you know, to have a son that's able to. Uh, you know, to really kind of, uh, that you can pass that torch on to and that is so uh, willing and able uh, to do so. Whilst, whilst you said that, it reminds me, and he doesn't even know about it, but I'm going to literally pass on the torch. This is a, one of the old Davidoff lighters, which was specially made for Davidoff by DuPont. It's got my initials on it, ES, in the front. And I'm going to present this to Eddie, passing on the torch to Eddie. <laughs> It's got your initials as well, it's E-S, oh. and when the time comes, you can pass it on to Elvis, because it will still have his initials on it, E-S. <laughs> so as you said, it passed on the torch, I literally and physically did that. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Uh, oh, well, beautiful. I don't, I don't even know how to, uh, with that, I think we're done. That, that, uh, there's, no, there's no way to continue that. Um, well, <laughs> gentlemen... <laughs> I must say, I'm approaching the end of the cigar. I just had to relight it uh, for the third time. And, um, you know, thank you so much. I, I mean, thank dear you. friends. Thank you so much. Thank you to you. Thank you to your viewers. I hope they enjoyed it. Uh, I very much enjoyed uh, talking to you. And thank you so much for the surprise bringing Hanky and Klaus uh, onto the screen. It was wonderful to see them as well. It is, it, it's really, it's, it's made my day, week, month. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, it's been a delight well, I'm, for me as well. I'm glad we could uh, to help facilitate this, which is really all we're here. I mean, that's all we are here at, uh, at Kirby Allison at the Hangar Project is, um, you know, really facilitating uh, uh, quality craft and tradition. And, um, you know, you guys are, are really so special to me because it's one of my most fondest memories, and it'll always, honestly, that shop in the corner of St. James's and German Street uh, will always be my anchor, uh, quite literally, um, you know, to London. And uh, you guys have done a superb job uh, just being so hospitable and welcoming. And, uh, you know, shoot, I probably was like a, I don't know, a 28 or 29-year-old little dimwit that walked in the shop, you know, interested in a few cigars. And you guys really indulged me and allowed me to sit down and enjoy your great company and conversation. And, uh, you know, you guys have been a tremendous influence upon me uh, personally. And uh, I thank you so much for that. Well, Kirby, uh, your, your modesty is the only thing that exceeds your kindness. Uh, you have done wonderful things uh, with your business, with your project. But most importantly, I'm absolutely delighted to include you in my close group of friends now. And if I have nothing else left at the end of my time with cigars, I will have wonderful friends. And you are very high on that list, Kirby. Thank you for everything you've done for us and I think for the cigar smoking community as well. Uh, thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, cigars in so many ways are just a conduit to great friends. And it's something we share in common. It's a way to pass the time. And uh, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of a, of a reprieve, of, of a retreat uh, from these um, you know, certainly uncertain kind of challenging times and for inviting us into your home, Edward, and sharing a very special cigar with us. I look forward to being able to smoke one of those in your company. Uh, mark me down. Uh, me I won't uh, allow. The invitation stands there forever, sir. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, stay safe. 
And, uh, you know, of course, we wish you all you so uh, much. good health. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you soon health. in London. And uh, we had some great videos with you guys planned for this trip, but uh, we'll, those are on hold. We'll, we'll get those uh, soon. Uh, but uh, God bless you guys. Thank you all. And, um, you know, we hope to see you all again soon. Thank, Thank you. To your great health. Cheers. You. Wow. I mean, Edward and Eddie Sahakian, I mean, uh, you know, for those that are watching, I really can't even begin to uh, overstate uh, just the tremendous uh, impact and importance they've had. I mean, you know, I just remember traveling to London, you know, being there for one of the first times, and uh, they really helped welcome me and make me feel like I had friends there. And uh, I'm so thankful that over the years, uh, that friendship has been able to mature and to develop and it's something meaningful that we were all able to share with you all right now. And uh, anyone that's in London, I mean, of course, you know, there's so many cigar merchants in Mon London, uh, but, um, you know, the Sahakians will always reign supreme uh, as uh, some of the classiest, well-dressed, and most hospitable uh, tobacconists of really the world. And I think in so many ways, uh, they've done such a tremendous job to really carry forward in so many ways uh, the tradition of Zeno Davidoff. Uh, who uh, has really imparted in that brand uh, just quality craftsmanship tradition, hospitality, friendship, uh, and just the enjoyment of good company over a cigar. And more than anything, that's what a cigar represents to me. Uh, so uh, for them to take some time out of their day uh, or their evening in, in London uh, to uh, share a cigar with us uh, is really kind of uh, the culmination um, uh, of this live stream series and uh, uh, this will always be something that I remember on fondly. So um, anyone that's in London, of course, uh, the next time you're there, make sure for sure uh, that you visit uh, Davidoff of London. I mean, that to me is really more of a, uh, of a, um, I don't know, what would you call it? Um, you know, more of a destination uh, than uh, Buckingham Palace or Trafalgar Square or the War Rooms. Uh, or any, anything on Savile Row. Um, and to be able to walk into that shop, uh, to have them help you select a cigar, uh, and then to be able to enjoy that is uh, really truly living life and experiencing uh, great things. So uh, thank you uh, to you guys uh, for taking time. We, of course, here at The Hangar Project are still open. If you're watching right now, please hit that red subscribe button, turn on your notifications. Um, HangarProject.com, we're still open. We'll be Kirby Allison soon. Uh, sometime in the next few weeks, we're fastly working on uh, launching a new website that will really kind of align our, our kind of branding identity. And, uh, you know, we're here to help you with all of your luxury garment care, shoe care, and other uh, luxury clothing accessory needs. I didn't get much of a time to kind of talk of it, but, of course, Davidoff of London. Uh, please do follow them on Instagram. Uh, you know, it's just one of the things I love about Instagram is uh, how it serves almost as a periscope uh, into other parts of the world. And so it's a great way to kind of see what they're up to, what they're doing. And uh, it's truly one of the great Instagram profiles. Kirby Allison, we pale in comparison to them, uh, but I'm certainly flattered by all those that follow us uh, on Instagram uh, at Kirby Allison. It's one of the best ways to really stay up to date uh, as to what we're doing here at Kirby Allison. Uh, we, of course, uh, promote all of our uh, Instagram lives there and uh, a lot of what else is going on, uh, not just in the life of the business, uh, but in my own personal life. Uh, and so uh, for all those that follow me, uh, we are, of course, certainly friends. You're welcome to message me. I get back to most of those people. And, um, you know, what else? Uh, the tie I'm wearing today, uh, not to seem too self-promotional, but we've got a large stock of ties that we just got in for spring, summer. Uh, that uh, unfortunately you all haven't the opportunity to wear out, uh, but this might be something that you're able to purchase uh, to hold uh, for your uh, kind of a debut uh, into uh, 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 society once we're, uh, this stay-at-home ban is, is all lifted. Uh, this particular tie I'll speak about, uh, let's pull that back up, Christian, if you don't mind. Uh, this is a, a sovereign grade basket weave tie, and this is a very special tie to me uh, because it was actually a gift from a good friend and dear close mentor of mine. He took it from his kind of uh, own uh, vintage stock of ties. And uh, I loved it so much, I wore it uh, so often 
especially in London, that I decided to have it actually recreated and offered uh, through Kirby Allison. And so uh, if there's ever a club tie that if you're wearing this tie on the streets, you can uh, certainly rest assured uh, that I will dart from across the street to come shake your hand and say hello. Uh, but this is as close to a club tie as we have. And so uh, our basket weave tie is amongst my favorites, a jack card, a beautiful texture, incredibly formal, and perfect to wear for uh, some of our most special occasions. Uh, Wellington shoelaces, of course, just because we got those in stock, uh, are amongst the finest available anywhere in the world, I must say. And uh, these are the same shoelaces uh, that much of the Northampton shoe tray uses uh, in the production of their shoes. And uh, shoelaces, surprisingly, are uh, difficult to find, especially here in America. And that is why this particular category has become kind of a little bit of a personal passion of mine. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as it comes to supporting friends, uh, we're running a promotion during the month of April. Uh, any of our certified shoe restoration services will receive a free upgrade uh, to a pair of either Triumph or Lulu toe plates. Uh, Jim McFarlane, a dear close friend of mine, our kind of resident uh, Kirby Allison cobbler, if you will, uh, does all this work himself. Uh, you can certainly rest assured that uh, he is the, uh, his hands are the only ones that actually touch your shoes. He's a third-generation cobbler, multi-award winning uh, cobbler, and I can guarantee you that there is no more skilled hands to do your recrafting job uh, than his. And uh, he's the only hands uh, at this point that I would trust uh, with a pair of my shoes. Uh, I've worked to design this program, uh, drawing on uh, really all my travels and experience uh, to really put together uh, what I believe is the finest uh, restoration service and resoling service available anywhere here in the United States. So if you have a favorite pair of shoes uh, that otherwise you wouldn't have time to send off uh, by mail uh, for two or three weeks, uh, really two weeks to be uh, resold, now's the time to do it. It looks like May 1st will be uh, the date that most of us reopen and are able to re-enter the world. Uh, and so uh, you've got uh, you know just about two weeks left to send your shoes off uh, to be resold, to have them returned to you uh, using uh, some of the finest materials and craftsmanship available anywhere. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, we've got, uh, gosh, we had uh, you know, probably several thousand of you that watched this live stream. Make sure you subscribe, hit your um, notification button uh, so that you can learn whenever we are uh, hosting more of these live streams. Uh, next week, we've got some incredible people lined up. Thomas Mahone of English Cut, he's now at another company. I think we're going to have Stephen Hitchcock from London joining us also, maybe even Eric Jensen. Uh, Pierre Corte has, enjoyed, has agreed to come on, uh, as, uh, as has uh, Tommaso uh, from Stefano Bimmer. So we have a lot of really uh, kind of interesting and very renowned, uh, accomplished guests uh, that have so graciously enjoyed to take uh, some of their time to join us on this live stream uh, during this uh, pandemic. So uh, thank you all. Uh, make sure that you're in touch with us. Uh, so that you can join us next week. I'm Kirby Allison, and as, as you guys know, there are few things that I enjoy more than quality, craftsmanship, and tradition. That's what we stand for here, and that is truly my passion. And thank you all for joining me, for taking a little bit of time out of your day uh, to have a drink with me and a smoke. So cheers.